Welcome and thank you for joining today's National Industrial Security Program Policy Advisory Committee meeting, also known as the NISPAC. To receive all pertinent information about upcoming NISPAC meetings, please subscribe to the Information Security Oversight Office's overview blog at https colon forward slash forward slash isu dash overview dot blogs dot archives dot gov or by going to the Federal Register. All available meeting materials, including today's agenda slides and biographies for NISPAC members and speakers, have been posted to the ISU website at https colon forward slash forward slash www.archives.gov forward slash ISU forward slash oversight dash groups forward slash NISPAC forward slash committee dot html and have also been emailed to all registrants. Please note not all NISPAC members and speakers have biographies or slides. It is preferred that you connect through your computer to listen to today's conference. However, you can call in as a secondary option. If you require technical assistance, please send a private chat message to the event producer. Please note all audio connections will be muted for the duration of the meeting with the exception of NISPAC members, speakers, and ISU. We are now, we are expecting a fairly large audience today. Because of this, we will not be taking questions from the public over the phone. Please email your questions and comments to nispac at nara.gov and someone will answer your questions there. Only ISU and NISPAC members will be authorized to ask questions throughout the meeting. This is a public meeting. Like previous NISPAC meetings, this will, will be recorded. This recording, along with the transcript and minutes, will be available within 90 days of the NISPAC Reports on Committee Activities webpage mentioned earlier. Let me now begin, turn things over to Mr. Mark Bradley, the Director of ISU, as well as the Chairman of NISPAC. Thank you so much, Mr. Producer, for your kind introduction. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the 70th meeting of the NISPAC. This is the seventh NISPAC meeting that's being conducted 100% virtually. Uh, we're planning on a five-minute break in the middle of the meeting, which I will flag as you move closer. Uh, we have the meeting scheduled for three hours, but I expect and hope it will be finished uh, well before that, and you can have some of your, uh, your morning back. I'm now going to turn it over to Ms. Heather Harris, the designated federal officer for the NISPAC, for some administrative actions. Heather, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will now begin attendance for the government members. I will state the name of the agency, then the agency member will reply by identifying themselves. Once I have gone through the government members, I will then move over to the industry members. After the industry members, I will then proceed to the speakers. ODNI. Good morning, Heather Valerie Kerbin, primary member. Thank you. DOD. Good morning, Heather. This is Jeff Spinninger. Thank you. DOE. Good morning, Heather. This is Natasha Sumter. I am an alternate member. Thank you. DHS. Good morning, Heather. This is Rich DeJoster, and I'm the alternate. Thank you. DCSA. Keith Minard. CIA. Good morning, Heather. This is Don, primary member for CIA. Thank you. Commerce. Good morning, Heather. This is Steve Barbieri. I'm the primary uh, for Commerce. Thank you. DOJ. Good morning, Heather. This is Christine Gunning, primary member. Thank you. NASA. Good morning. This is Vaughn Simon, primary member. Thank you. State. Good morning, it's Kim Bogger, primary member. Thank you, Air Force. Good morning, Annie Backus, Department of the Air Force alternate. Thank you, Navy. Good morning, Steve James, primary member. Thank you. Now I'm going to turn to the industry members. Heather Sims. Heather Sims, industry NISPAC. Derek Jones. Good morning, Derek Jones, industry NISPAC. Tracy Durkin. Good morning, Tracy Durkin, Industry NISPAC. Greg Sadler. Good morning, Greg Sadler, Industry NISPAC. Dave Tender. Good morning, Dave Tender, Industry NISPAC. Ike Rivers. 
Good morning, Mike Rivers, Industry NISPAC. Jane Dinkle. Good morning, Jane Dinkle, Industry NISPAC. Thank you all. Now I'll do a roll call for the speakers. Dave Scott. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Mike Ray. Yes, good morning. I'm here. All right, great. NRC and Army will not be present for the call, so if there are questions for them, please send an email to nispac at nara.gov and we can forward it to them. If anyone else is speaking during the NISPAC that we have not heard from or we don't know about, please speak now. Thank you. We request that everyone identify themselves by name and agency, if applicable, before speaking each time for the record. I wanted to provide everyone with our agency's COVID update. Most of the ISU staff is still teleworking. We do not currently have restrictions on in-person meetings for NARA staff in all NARA buildings. However, for large public meetings such as this, we are staying virtual. Hopefully in a year, we will be back to in-person NISPAC meetings at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. I want to remind the government membership of the requirement to annually file a financial disclosure report with the National Archives and Records Administration Office of General Counsel. Before a government member may serve on the NISPAC and annually thereafter, this must be done. The same form for financial disclosure that is used throughout the, for, for, throughout the federal government, OGE Form 450, satisfies the reporting requirement. If there are questions, please reach out to me. Additionally, we have had a few changes to the NISPAC membership. As discussed during the last meeting, our prior designated federal officer, Greg Pannoni, retired. I am acting for him at this time. We have also had a change at the Commerce Department. Richard Townsend has been replaced by Steve Barbieri. Our CIA primary is now Don, replacing Felicia. And the NASA replacement for Kenneth Jones is Vaughn Simon. We would also like to welcome our two new industry members, Ike Rivers and Jane Dinkle, who are replacing Rosie Barrero Jones and Cheryl Stone. For those departed members, thank you for all of your contributions over the years. We look forward to continuing the work you have done with the new representatives. I also want to thank Mark Bradley, the director of ISU and chairman of the NISPAC. This will be his last NISPAC, as he is expecting to retire before the next public meeting in June 2023. Thank you for your lifetime of federal service, especially the last six years as the director of ISU. It has been an honor to work for you. We wish you well and look forward to continuing the work you have done. I will now address the items of interest from the April 27, 2022 NISPAC public meeting. The NISPAC minutes from the last meeting were certified to be true and correct and were finalized by me on August 8, 2022 and were posted to the ISU website on August 9, 2022. The first item of interest is that during the last NISPAC meeting, DOD had requested the NISPAC meet three times a year, Vice 2. During this, meet, during this meeting, the chair will seek an advisory opinion from the full committee on whether it would be useful for fiscal year 2023 to hold three NISPAC meetings or whether we should continue to hold two. Since the last NISPAC meeting, we also continue to work the ISU notice discussing the Small Business Administration regulation combining their mentor-protege programs issued in the fall of 2020. The SBA rule appears to eliminate the requirement for a joint venture to have an Entity Eligibility Determination, or EED, also known as a Facility Clearance, or FCL, in all cases if the entities making up the joint venture already have EEDs themselves. However, this interpretation of the regulation's language is not what the regulation intends and would contradict NISP requirements. In coordination with SBA, we will be issuing an ISO notice to clarify the joint venture EED requirements. Additionally, we continue to have discussions for NISP entity cost collection with the Cognizant Security Agencies and Offices, also known as CSAs and CSOs. This collection is required by executive order. The cost that will be collected will include information on NISP implementation costs incurred by entities under their security cognizance. The next meeting is November 30th, where all NISPAC members will be in attendance to discuss the way ahead. Once finalized, we will advise the NISPAC chair on the way forward for collecting these data cost elements for industry's implementation of the NISP. The final item of interest is that industry was going to start meeting with DCSA about concerns for how long it takes a company to get cleared, but those meetings have not yet been set up. 
Additionally, ISU has three job announcements that have closed, one for a senior program analyst and two CUI program analysts. We hope to have them both on board before the next NISPAC. Do any NISPAC members have any questions? All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Heather. As uh, Heather mentioned at the last meeting, we discussed changing the number of public NISPAC meetings a year from two to three. As a reminder, I'm seeking only an advisory opinion at this time. I'll weigh all considerations before deciding exactly what course to follow. But in the meantime, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say the name of the agency and then please respond with your name and whether you want two or three NISPAC meetings a year. Then I will ask industry members to vote in the same manner. ODNI? Two for ODNI. Two, okay, thank you, Valerie. DOD? Uh, this is Jeff Spinager, three for DOD. Okay. DOE? Good morning, this is Natasha Sumter, and we would prefer two for DOE. Okay, thank you. NRC? Heather, you're gonna circle back with them, right? Yes, sir. Okay, DHS? This is Rich DeJosseran, we vote for two. Okay, thank you, Rich. DCSA? Keith Minard, three. Okay, CIA? Good morning, Mark, it's been a long time. Um, yeah. uh, we're gonna vote for two. Okay, thank you. sure. Department of Commerce? Oh, we're gonna vote for three. Okay, Department of Justice? This is Christine Gunning, two for DOJ. All right, thank you, Christine. NASA? This is Vaughn Simon for NASA, two for NASA. Okay, head of your circle back with NSA. Uh, State Department? Three for State Department, thanks. Three for State, sure. Air Force? Three for Air Force, thank you. Three, you're welcome. Department of Navy? Uh, this is Steve James, three for Navy. Okay, Department of the Army? That's right, you're gonna circle back with them too, right? Yes, sir. Okay, got it. All right, now I'm gonna to turn to the industry members. Uh, Heather Sims? Heather Sims, Industry News Pack. I vote for two with a caveat that we revitalize the working groups to make them more impactful. Okay, got that duly noted. All right, does April Abbott ever join us or not? All right, don't hear her. Yeah, Mark, I'm sorry. Mark, I just heard from her. She has, she has a meeting right now that's overlapping, but she's going to try and call in very soon. All right. Uh, Heather, if you could record her vote. It's, it's yes, sir. At some point. Okay. Yes. Derek Jones? Uh, Derek Jones, three. All right. Tracy Durkin? Tracy Durkin, three. Okay. Greg Sadler? Two with the caveat of enforce or improve function of the working groups. Okay, duly noted. Dave Tender. Uh, two with the uh, same caveat that Heather and Greg just brought up. All righty, duly noted. Ike Rivers. Uh, two, same caveat, please. Okay, sure, duly noted. Jane Dinkle. I vote for two with the same caveat regarding the working groups. All right. All right, thank you very much. Heather, I've written them all down. You wanna tally the vote just as it stands for now? I guess, sir, during the meeting right now? Yeah. Okay, OD and I. What's the final tally for, you know? Yes, sir, so. No, 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 I mean oh. the, I, I'm sorry, no, I'm, I'm not being clear, the, uh, the total. How many for two, how many for three? 12 for two. Okay. And eight for three. Okay, it was at least a handful still waiting to vote. All right, so anyway, we, we will uh, take this back and, and have a look at it once we get the full uh, the full tally. Thank you very much for, uh, for doing that, y'all. Okay, at this time, uh, we'll now introduce our speakers for our updates. Uh, Ms. Heather Sims, an ISPAC industry spokesperson, will provide the industry update. Heather, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sims from Industry. Um, good morning, everybody. It's my pleasure to provide another industry update as the NISPAC industry spokesperson. 
Um, for me, it's hard to believe that I'm entering my fourth year on the NISPAC and as a spokesperson, and we have only had the opportunity to have two public meetings in person. So I look forward to meeting in person again. I'd like to take the opportunity to uh, once again thank the outgoing industry NISPAC members, Rosie Barrio and Cheryl Stone for their dedicated efforts on the NISPAC over the last four years. Also, I'd like to welcome Isaiah, Ike Rivers, and Jane Dinkle. I look forward to working with you on the industry NISPAC team um, this coming year. Since our last meeting, Mr. Greg Pannoni, as Heather mentioned, retired from ISU. I would personally like to take the time to thank Greg for his partnership with industry and the commitment to the NISPAC, always ensuring industry had a seat at the table and a voice in the conversation. Industry wishes Greg well in his future endeavors. This update will be a little bit different in the fact that instead of utilizing my entire time talking about open and unresolved items of interest with our government counterparts, I feel it more important to provide an overview of the role of the industry on NISPAC and how the industry memorandum of understanding further referred to as MOU associations assist industry NISPAC in capturing and resolving issues for all of industry. Industry is sometimes challenged by allowing ourselves to be divided, sometimes at the hands of our government partners, sometimes by a misunderstanding, and sometimes by a lack of understanding that industry is much larger than our own companies and our own self-interest. What may have been a priority for one company that is discussed with our government counterparts may not be an issue for another company and vice versa. In the past three years, I will stand strong on my commitment that a united industry is much stronger than a divided industry base. A strong industry base can better support national security by working as a united group to assist our government on the impacts of emerging and existing policies that may have an impact on industry and help resolve to further the safety and security of our country. Recently, there has been a mention of an effort or intent to create a new industry representation group, either through the creation of a new policy advisory committee or through formal group independently meeting with cognizant security agencies, legislation, legislators, and or government regulators for the purpose of speaking for the whole of industry often driving the voice of industry to their association or certain members of industry lobbying on behalf of their own self-interest and benefit. With that in mind, I thought it prudent to provide a reminder as to why industry was created and how industry plays a vital role in national security. The NISPAC was created January 8, 19 by Executive Order 12829. The NISPAC was and is still comprised of 16 governments and eight industry members. The current Industry members are April Abbott, Tracy Durkin, Greg Sadler, Dave Tender, Jane Dinkle, Mike Rivers, and myself, each serving a total of four years, all the while still working the full-time positions at their current employer. <clears throat> we often forget to take the time, forget the time and commitment our employers allow each of the industry and respect members to commit to helping with the collective cleared industry concerns. Therefore, we want to thank for the employers for allowing industry members to represent industry on the NISPAC. There's also a little mystery around how, government, how industry members are nominated and selected, so I'd like to offer some insight. Every year, current industry NISPAC members and current MOU members nominate potential industry NISPAC members for the two upcoming vacancies. Voting is held by the same industry NISPAC and MOU members for each cast two votes. In the end, the top two votes are elected into NISPAC. We do our best to remind all voting members and nominated members that the role of the NISPAC is to represent all national industrial security program companies and not their own self-interest, company's interest or specific government agency interest. This is taken into consideration when votes are cast. Who is a trusted person who can best represent all of industry, liaison with the five CSAs and work well among all the industry to collect input? It's a selfless four years. Those that are chosen serve uh, and put their tireless efforts should be focused on making sure all of industry has a voice and not fighting amongst ourselves or putting ourselves above the interests of all of industry, which can have a long lasting negative effect on how industry is viewed by our government counterparts. While we try and have everyone in the industry involved, it simply isn't possible for all cleared industry to participate on the NISPAC. However, 
there are several NISPAC working group opportunities that industry, industry members can be involved in covering a variety of NISP topics. During these working groups, we intend to work, work with our government partners to resolve a variety of issues affecting industry. Industry NISPAC is continuously reviewing industry working group members to ensure we have a diversity of industry representation based on company size, complexity, and skill level. Ensuring the same company and the same person isn't on every single working group, which sometimes is the case. Therefore, you have the same people for years driving the discussion and focus on for industry without consideration to the other 10,000 plus companies in the NISP. Industry NISPAC simply cannot operate independently without excluding critical input from the support from our MOU industry association. While industry is officially recognized through the NISPAC membership, individual representations from the MOU group support the NISPAC in several ways, including participation in the working group, making recommendations to the NISPAC on proposed and revised national security policy at the request of the industry NISPAC spokesperson. The MOU group supports the industry, NISPAC industry spokesperson in NISPAC matters and initiatives, as with NISPAC industry representation. MOU group's representatives agree that they will not act as representation for the specific company. Instead, they represent the constituency of the respective organization or association, and by extension, all private sector members of the National Industrial Security Program. Nothing in the MOU agreement, however, prohibits, prevents each individual association or organization from adopting its own position on a particular issue, or from abstaining from the vote of or proposal thought to be contrary contradicting to the wish of its membership. There are currently nine MOU industry associations supporting the industry NISPAC with the additional organization working through the formal process to be added. Current MOUs include the following, Aerospace Industries Association, as is Defense and Counterintelligence Council, Contractor Special Security Working Group, Federally Funded Research and Development Centers, University Affiliated Research Centers, Intelligence and National Security Alliance, Industry Security Working Group, National Classification Management Society, National Defense Industrial Association, and Personal Security Council. Industry and its PAC members cannot operate in a vacuum, but also have to be cognizant of we cannot tackle every and every concern. Therefore, we have to operate strategically and prioritize industry issues. There are a variety of needs that industry and its PAC tries to capture industry input. While virtually impossible to know every single company in the cognizance of the five CSAs, we do our best to try and reach each. Fundamentally, as a group, we seek industry synergy and work towards capturing a good understanding of what industry representation, either through the NISPAC or MOU, are working on. Industry NISPAC meets monthly, actually more often as issues come up, and also monthly as a full group with our MOU security points of contact. These are critical discussions to ascertain all the issues and narrow down to what we can do as a group to prioritize and may lead to other efforts. All the years, industry NISPAC members have increased our presentation, over the, excuse me, over the years, industry NISPAC members have increased our presentation to a variety of industry events throughout the year and country. It's a great source of education for both industry and government members alike to hear concerns from all levels but also provide an overview of the NISPAC and industry and indeed represent at the national level. This year, we have established a quarterly newsletter in efforts to try and reach those companies in the NISP that are not members of industry associations to let them know they are represented and do have a voice. So far, we have issued two newsletters and seek assistance from each of the five CSAs to share with their clear population. <clears throat> Another way we attempt to hear from cleared industries is through email communications. A few years ago, industry NISPAC created a dedicated email account where cleared industry can contact eight, their eight industry NISPAC representatives directly. Over the past three years, we have been able to assist and resolve a variety of issues, directed the submitter to the correct point of contact, and simply allowed us to watch for trending topics coming directly from industry members. While this next one does cause some controversy, industry NISPAC does do some work with the chief security officers of the largest cleared contractors. Purely by size and totality of revenue from government sources, these CSOs have a unique knowledge and understanding of the impact that the NIST has on the security operations. Their input is vital, for, vital to the discussion 
as industry and its tax works with our government partners on emerging policies and oversight procedures. While some would say that an industry impact does not represent all of industry and government should not listen to certain individuals, um, this negatively only this, this negatively provides a view on industry that sometimes the loudest and most aggressive voices be heard at the detriment to the other industry companies. If there are recommendations on how we can improve, please utilize one of the means I previously mentioned to bring your ideas forward so we're all heard. I hope that this quick News Pack 101 overview is helpful. I would be remiss if I did not at least discuss the per very purpose of holding the public News Pack meeting. And this is to discuss those very industry concerns that we have not been uh, sufficiently resolved through our formal News Pack working group. A continued thank you to PAC PMO, ODNI, and OPM for the industries and industry mispack reviewing Trusted Workforce 2.0 strategic documents to ascertain the impact to the industry prior to the release. This has been a success at the strategic level, but industry is still already experiencing issues with the implementation at all levels with the enormous variances in the understanding and execution at each of the military services locations and government agencies. Industry looks to capturing examples um, where we're seeing impacts to industry and sharing with ODNI, PAC PMO, and OPM. It's often understood by both government and industry that industry NISPAC members work with all five CSAs and not just DOD. Industry NISPAC is committed to working more proactively with those CSAs over the next year, attempting, attempting to capture and bring issues to the point to the points of contact for early resolution. Industry NISPAC will also be committed to partnering at the right level. More than not, industry is forgetful that DOD is the CSA and DCSA is the CSO working on behalf of DOD. Industry NISPAC will be increasing their collaboration and conversations with the DOD representation on the NISPAC. With that said, industry appreciates the support of DOD and DCSA that they have offered to industry over this past year while we implement 32 CFR Part 117. There were many areas of clarification, questions about implementation, and concerns for the many interpretations the oversight agency uh, were making to industry's compliance with 32 CFR. DCSA specific with Keith Miner, Matt Rhodes, Jason Steinauer, and many others quickly sprang into action and listened to industry and offered a variety of guidance through fact sheets, job aids, and training seminars. We appreciate the support and commitment to assist industry in understanding the changes. Industry would also like to thank VROC for the support over the past six months in providing guidance and support as continuous vetting is maturing. An item that has been brought up by industry over the last two years at the public NISPAC meetings and working group that has not been resolved is the timeliness of the new, for new companies to receive a facility clearance or upgrades for existing cleared companies. While DCSA has initiated a process to track timelines and process improvement, it's still an issue and more, more and more companies are requesting support from industry in this past. This should be a concern for all of industry and government alike. Risk avoidance could and may impact industry's ability to deliver on the next critical military platform, ensuring America's military superiority. Industry looks forward to discussing the larger issues and concerns with DOD the next few weeks to get a real solution to improve this longstanding and growing concern. DCSA heard industry's concern about the National Background Investigation System, and industry appreciates the increased industry collaboration and communi communication. While there are so many concerns, such as operability, data integrity, and support for industry once the system is online, we are appreciative of being heard and for the opportunity for industry NISPAC working group members to work on improvement. Finally, an overwhelming thank you to industry for your efforts this past year and during COVID for keeping up the watch for the most part, maintaining solid security programs while implementing a new 32 CFR Part 117, implementation of DCSA oversight and rating process, rolling out trusted workforce 2.0 and C3 implementation. All these major changes all at once on top of shrinking budgets is a feat, no doubt, and you should be commended for your effort and commitment to do your part for national security. I would like to thank you for the time and open up the remainder of my time for any questions and comments, and then also to the other industry NISPAC members if there are any additional comments. Thank you. 
Anyone have any questions for uh, Heather? Any, any reaction? Well, thank you, Heather, especially for that uh, lesson on history. It's important to be reminded about how all this came about and what it stands for. I'm now going to turn to uh, Mr. Jeff Spinninger, Director for Critical Technology Protection for the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security, who will give an update on behalf of DOD as the NISP Executive Agent. Jeffrey, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, good, good morning, everyone. Uh, I, I'd like to begin and, uh, and echo, I'm sure you, you'll, what'll, what'll be a bit of a theme today, and that is, uh, you know, expressing my thanks, Mark, uh, to you. Uh, you know, it was a bit of, it came as a, a slight bit of a surprise to know that this would be your last um, NISPAC. Uh, that's no small undertaking. Your leadership, uh, you know, during some interesting times, to say the least, has been steady, uh, and, and, um, and, and I think, you know, sometimes we, we don't really uh, appreciate what that is until we don't have it. Um, I know that that's uh, that, that I, I think I can speak on behalf of a whole lot of folks here to, that will say with that thank you for that. I imagine we'll have some more to say about you um, um, if, if, whether you're on the call or you're not on the call um, uh, you know in in the weeks and months ahead but uh, but thank you for that. I also like to uh, to to, to repre uh, say say uh, thank you to Heather uh, who has uh, stepped in. Uh, adroitly, uh, right, we find ourselves saying Greg who, um, and that's a, that's a good thing, although uh, it was nice to see him in a slightly different capacity last week. All that to say uh, that the, uh, the, the work that ISOO uh, undertakes, uh, you know, uh, to, to, uh, to execute the responsibilities of the NISPAC uh, on behalf of all of the CSAs and industry, uh, you know, an, a, an accumulated tally that puts us comfortably into the millions uh, is uh, is no small thing, uh, and and it uh, it's also not uh, without its uh, remarkable importance. Much of which um, Heather Sims outlined today, uh, you, you know, and I, which I and which I would like to echo. So uh, thank you for that. And um, with that, it's uh, it is good to be here again for what is the final meeting of the year. Um, we've got a number of topics to cover. Uh, we like uh, taking advantage of the opportunity to be on the record here. Um, uh, trans transparency and accountability are kind of recurrent themes um, uh, because that's how we're able to get things done. Um, so uh, coming to common understanding, um, it, we, we can't always promise that we're going to get, uh, you know, to consensus, uh, but we can at least get to common understanding. And I'm not aware of a better forum for that uh, than the NISPAC. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll jump in in no particular order. Um, I want to provide a brief update on where we stand on cloud sandbox. Uh, we've uh, talked about it in the last couple of, of public meetings. Uh, there's been a bevy of work uh, in, in between those meetings, um, and uh, you know, all of which really reinforces what is fairly obvious, but I, I don't think is um, uh, you know um, can be overstated uh, the relevance of cybersecurity uh, and this and within its framework uh, within the NISPOM. Uh, safeguarding information in the hands of, uh, of industry and systems, uh, you know, is, is again, uh, fairly obvious and straightforward. Uh, the application of cloud, um, you know, solutions to meet those responsibilities and requirements uh, is, um, you know, the first time out of the shoot is, uh, is, is uh, you know, will, will be a bit of a pathfinder for us as we move forward. Uh, we're as close to that as we've been, um, thanks to outstanding leadership and initiative from DCSA. Uh, and industry partners, uh, you know, to uh, you know, to, to kind of help to to create that path. Um, we'll have some more to say about that on the other. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very sure at the at the upcoming NISP, uh, NISPAC. But to kind of focus in on the continuing initiatives uh, that uh, my office is pleased to sponsor, uh, we continue to, uh, to to leverage the Applied Research Laboratory for Intelligence and Security (ARLIS), the, the York sponsored by my, our office. Uh, to establish uh, and initiate a, uh, what we call a, a affectionately a classified cloud sandbox, which is intended uh, to be, uh, you know, a, a mechanism for research framework uh, so that we can explore, uh, you know, both the potential uh, and, and, uh, and maybe, uh, you know, challenges that, uh, that cl cloud, uh, cloud represents uh, for enterprise uh, solutions uh, that are consistent with NISPOM expectations. Um, uh, we've made, uh, you know, again, uh, quite a bit of good headway there uh, based on uh, some really smart researchers and, uh, and again, that initiative and willingness to, uh, to, to uh, participate. I mentioned DCSA. I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention DISA, who is, uh, 
who's also a partner in this, um, you know, as, uh, as we try to get it right. Uh, we've been quite deliberate uh, because there's right and fast. Uh, we want right, and, uh, and I think we're making a, a tremendous, uh, tremendous headway there. The project itself um, is, uh, is intended to be a pathway to move from what have been largely theoretical discussions uh, into a real-world example to understand the applicability of cloud uh, services and solutions uh, and what they represent to uh, what are enduring and steady-state security requirements. Um, understanding where, what the policy says, uh, under uh, places where, where there are, are need for interpretations that can be consistently uh, defined and then therefore consistently applied and examined, um, and to uh, you know uh, to to explore those places where there may be gaps uh, within policy. I'm very pleased to uh, to to uh, to report that it, to this moment it continues to be that we don't see impediments, policy impediments of any st uh, stripe uh, within the framework uh, of the CFR, uh, uh, either the NISP CFR or the NISPOM CFR. Uh, and that's really um, quite important. I will say, uh, without going into a lot of detail, because I would only frankly embarrass myself on the record, uh, and uh, that, that there are complications on the acquisition side of things that we're, uh, we're looking to resolve. We've, we're having the right discussions uh, with the right empowered officials in the department who manage uh, you know, uh, D DFAR rules uh, that relate to how cloud would be defined or cloud requirements could be defined. Uh, and uh, I will uh, put myself on notice to hopefully have an update um, that's uh, substantive uh, next time we all get together. Um, so uh, we're, we, we continue to welcome, uh, you know, interest from the NISPAC. Uh, you know, um, uh, this would maybe be one of those areas that integrated working groups uh, you would, uh, would be keen to examine. Uh, and uh, if working groups, uh, you know, can involve field trips, uh, we'd be happy to play host to uh, to, uh, uh, to a working group to sort of take, uh, you know, what are what are words to this moment and uh, and understand what uh, what a sandbox initiative looks like. Um, I'm very sure that our program manager for Arlis is not on the call right now, so I will absolutely and happily put her on the X uh, to facilitate that if the working group. Um, um, uh, or NISPAC in general has, uh, has interest in that. Um, uh, as was mentioned in the ISU update, right, so we're really ha pleased to, to hear, uh, you know, of, of, a, of a forthcoming uh, a working group meeting uh, looking at NISP costs, right, you know, again, uh, you know, in testament to the measured approach that ISU has taken, I think it's been really smart to be prudent and quite deliberate, understanding you know, that we have a regulatory requirement to report, um, but again, getting it fast versus getting it right. Uh, those of you who've been around um, a time or two know that the, the report, um, cost reporting uh, in the past, uh, last time it was really done in earnest, um, there was consensus among the, the group that there were some inaccuracies. Um, uh, and, and we want to be able to get it right. I think that's very important to inform uh, decision making. Uh, you know, with all due deference to all of the NISP CSAs out there, um, the department's uh, bite of that apple is a bit larger uh, in terms of volume, but most importantly in, in terms of cost. Uh, making sure that we can uh, accurately reflect what that looks like uh, relates to that transparency and accuracy uh, that we think is really quite essential. Um, uh, given the, the state of things uh, in the world, um, as, such as they are. Um, with that, uh, however, we also want to make sure that it's deliberate uh, and that in, in, in meeting the requirements accurately, uh, that we do so with uh, the appropriate measures of, uh, of, of security uh, so that we're not giving away, uh, you, know, uh, you know, information that would actually undermine the, the, the nature of the program. So. Uh, just to lay out a few things that I, I hope the working group, uh, when it meets, uh, will take up in earnest uh, and that we can move forward on, um, uh, certainly as we move into the, the current budget cycle. Um, that would be uh, something that would be well-timed for the NISPAC uh, to, to represent, um, because I will say the department, we are moving forward um, with that right now uh, that's responsive to a number of internal tasking that, uh, that have been levied on us uh, to be able to assist with uh, senior department understanding of these issues and of security costs generally so, uh, uh, so that uh, we can make smart investments um, uh, to, to, meet, to, meet our, to meet the department's needs. Um, I say that because, uh, you know, with again, acknowledgement to the other CSAs out there, 
noting that you know we're lar the largest piece of the pie, but to have a complete picture uh, which would support the administration is something again that we would uh, you know look to tuck in behind this PACs um, and ISU's leadership on this issue uh, to, to move forward. Um, uh, I, again, uh, uh, it's almost as if uh, Heather had uh, stolen my notes, uh, but very pleased for the update uh, with respect to joint ventures. Um, we think that's encouraging. It's absolutely essential, um, uh, and, and, and really, frankly, your, your com you know, you, the, the direction it appears that this is going in terms of coming with a common understanding between uh, certainly uh, ISU, NISPAC, uh, and, uh, and the Small Business Administration seems uh, like we're we're in 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 the right direction. I noted uh, that you mentioned an ISU notice would be forthcoming. Uh, I don't want to put anybody on the X here, but if you can uh, maybe put some fidelity to that, so we could help to manage some expectations as to when that would be helpful. Um, and then it would be equally instructive to know the extent to which, uh, or if it's possible, that the Small Business Administration would reciprocate in whatever forum and, and communications that they put out, so that there is level set understanding. Um, that would be maybe uh, to be anticipating of places where there could be disconnects where security issues and small business administrative issues uh, may not uh, may not completely align even in uh, you know those those small uh, mom and pop shops that we all like to um, to um, contemplate um, and so uh, inside the in, inside the department we have taken uh, you know, some initiative here to try to be able to resolve this in a consistent way across the expanse of the department. Um, and so, uh, as was briefed in a prior, in the prior, last in this pack, uh, or the first one this year, um, we uh, proposed a memorandum regarding joint ventures and FCL requirements. Um, we uh, drafted what, what internal of the department is referred to as a directive type memorandum uh, that will provide guidance, uh, uniform guidance uh, on, on joint ventures. Uh, that have been awarded DOD classified contracts until such time as, uh, as the uh, you know as revised policy uh, can can be published. And I, uh, with that, I would say I think the notice uh, again kind of unread. I think conceptually it's easy to say that that will be helpful, but I I think it's equally easy to say that that probably will not completely solve the problem, right? So uh, because we still have two parts of within. Uh, you know, within a legal framework, regulatory or statute, uh, that uh, that don't that don't line up. So, um, so an important first step. Don't want to take anything away from that. Uh, would be very keen to to have uh, some understanding as to what that may say and when. Um, but uh, I, I believe it would be fair to say that the work will continue. Um, uh, we will do the same. I think we're at a point now where our DTM is uh, is shareable in draft form. And I'm willing to commit to put that out so uh, the other CSAs can see how the department is looking to approach that. Um, it'll say draft in big, bold, watermark type, uh, so that uh, noting that um, a memorandum of this type are really an exercise in eighth grade English essays, meaning that we write it down, we put all the right uh, technical wording in there, and then we hand it to a series of editors. Um, and um, and uh, you know, um, and, and see where we are. We're pretty far down the road on that, um, but we would still be in a place where it wanted, it's good to share. And if there are inputs that uh, that the CSAs uh, and uh, NISPAC, uh, you know, excuse me, ISU would uh, would have, um, I think we'd be pleased to at least uh, be able to bake them in to the extent that we're able. Um, uh, I pr appreciate uh, in, in the industry update Heather mentioning um, uh, you know uh, attention putting some attention on clearance timelines facility clearance timelines uh, and uh, in, and, uh, and and the challenges that we're, we're facing right now for particularly for new entrants um, that's uh, I, I think that's great again with a, that eye for transparency and accountability that NISPAC affords all of us um, uh, collectively uh, that that's the best way for us to be able to kind of understand or remediate uh, to the extent that we're able to while make sure that of course uh, we're meeting the expectations uh, of the industrial security program so that there is confidence uh, in you know uh, you know when a company is granted a facility clearance that there's confidence in its meaning and, and what that can represent uh, across uh, you know one contract or a multitude uh, which is you know um, such as circumstances may be and uh, I should say that it means the same thing uh, regardless of where that contract is awarded be it across uh, uh, you know the department uh, and, and any of the awarding contracting activities that, that award contracts with requirements for access to classified um, within supply chains of prime contractors 
and uh, na naturally across uh, those other places where uh, there are there are dependencies on department processes for clearance granting, uh, which is frankly most of the government. So, um, so again, get it fast or get it right. Uh, we know we have some work to do here. Uh, DCSA uh, is 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 pretty keenly focused on this, right? The, the director uh, has you know put a premium on uh, on really examining all aspects of the National Industrial Security Program. Uh, you know, that, so the agency has the right optic on it. Uh, those of us in the department that have responsibilities here who do not work in DCSA, uh, you know, are, are endeavoring to make sure that we're good partners with the agency who has the lion's share of the responsibility here, and uh, we'll continue to update you, uh, you know, with the, with the emphasis and, and the suggestions from our industry colleagues in particular about, about the value, the potential, I should say, value of the working groups. This is one of those things where I, I believe that there are some objective, uh, you know, uh, work group uh, outcomes that could be laid laid out here, and and that we could provide um, meaningful update, uh, you know, in uh, in a future NISPAC um, and the next NISPAC meeting. Um, so that's great. Uh, on the bright side of this thing here, and I don't think uh, I don't want to take anything away from DCSA. Uh, and, and what the remarks may be, but I feel like it's appropriate for, uh, from a department level to really uh, call out what is, what is uh, you know, a, a really not, I think, an outstanding body of, of work with respect to the NIST contract classification system, right? So uh, a lot of work, years and years of work uh, went into establishing the requirement, documenting it within the, within the framework of the FAR uh, and putting it to bear, right? So that, that's, that's a slog in and of itself. The system aspects of these things are sometimes pieces and parts that we take for granted, um, but it turns out that it's pretty hard to put systems out there that have responsibilities that are cut across the, the federal executive branch uh, and, and, of course, have, uh, have, have uh, touch points, uh, you know, across industry. Um, the initial NCCS, um, you know, was successful because it was rolled out, uh, but problematic because, um, our patients for anything IT is uh, essentially non-existent, and so um, uh, and and so uh, DCSA took it on its own, and uh, in, in what was frankly um, not without some controversy uh, to rem remediate, uh, you know, and, uh, and and take some initiatives leveraging cloud, frankly, uh, to uh, to come up with a better uh, means of of collecting uh, what are very important, uh, you know, uh, supporting elements related to the NISP, and that is uh, the electronic DD-254s. Uh, so they, they have done that. Uh, they took a lot of slings and arrows, more than a few from my office, frankly, um, and, that, uh, and, and elsewhere about uh, taking a system offline uh, because of what that means in, uh, in, a, in a larger FAR world. Um, but we're better for it. Uh, they rolled it out back in the summer, uh, early summer, I think. Uh, and, uh, and, and if I'm, I wanted to take the opportunity, one, to call out what is uh, really a remarkable success by the agency, but also, frankly, to call out that the good news is it's out there. Uh, the challenge that remains for us is it's not being used all that much. And so um, we'll, uh, we'll be looking for uh, to, to memorialize the, uh, a reminder uh, across the OD agencies uh, here, that, that should be forthcoming fairly quickly. But because it is FAR based, uh, I felt like this was an appropriate forum and, and really, frankly, the right time to put out there that uh, this is something that everyone is supposed to do here. Uh, security professionals who are on this call today uh, carrying that back, uh, you know, and working with our, our acquisition counterparts to really kind of dust off that reminder, I think, um, uh, you know, again, uh, with a nod to work groups and, uh, and, and really the, the next update, uh, we can say, well, we're pretty close to zero use, use rate right now. Um, uh, I think, uh, you know, with a little bit of initiative and some energy out of, frankly, today, uh, we could see a substantial uptick. Um, and I think that would be, uh, you know, uh, really quite uh, good for a whole host of reasons. Um, and finally, uh, just a couple more uh, updates here real fast. Uh, so, um, you know, um, we're pleased to have had some contact here, uh, you know, recently, uh, you know, in what has, uh, you know, been a continuing challenge, uh, you know, where there's been observations from, from industry um, uh, associations and groups regarding um, delays uh, that are sometimes experienced, and by sometimes I mean most of the time, uh, when employees move from one contract, uh, you know, for which access uh, is is a requirement primarily focused on SCI, 
Um, uh, in, and in particular, INSA provided uh, several recommended courses of action, uh, you know, which uh, we have taken for action to explore, um, noting that this is not an eligibility discussion, that it is an access discussion, and, uh, and, and um, uh, you know, and I'll, I'll make it through the entirety of this little update without saying the R word, because uh, it doesn't apply. Um, but uh, but based on uh, you know some good data uh, and and uh, and and uh, you know um, you know uh, uh, you know frank inputs uh, you know uh, that we we've worked on it we have a draft memo that is largely a reiteration right so again we don't have really a policy problem here we have a little bit of an interpretation challenge uh, the NISP is a big place the Department of Defense is a big place uh, you see the world where you sit on it all those sorts of things. Um, but uh, starting with uh, to be able to reiterate what is uh, permissible within the framework here, we think is something that we in the department are able to undertake. Uh, we're pretty sure that there's a uh, uh, and, and, and are committed to do. Uh, we're pretty sure that that's a pretty short path for us, uh, for which we will soon then be reaching out to our counterparts uh, in DNI uh, to make sure that we have their take. Uh, we're going to do that. We think we're at a point with, uh, with the way in which we're putting this guidance together that we'll be reaching over. Um, I don't generally like to forecast too much, but I think this is a really kind of timely issue and one that's of, of uh, substantial interest to an awful lot of folks in industry. Uh, and, and candidly, uh, there's, uh, there's interest uh, you know, from the Hill. Uh, so we think it's a, a good to put ourselves out there in this way uh, so that we can help to, to hopefully get some uh, fairly prompt feedback from our counterparts. Uh, uh, on the IC side of the house and, uh, and put out, uh, you know, uh, smart guidance here. Uh, I know that that's not the end of the discussion. It's probably more like the beginning in terms of what the government uh, and the department are able to do, but we think it's a necessary place to start, it's consistent with other initiatives that we have out here and, frankly, other interests that we have within the department and, and a little bit beyond. So more work to come on that, but putting ourselves out there so that, uh, you know, again, transparency and accountability so that, uh, that everyone knows uh, how we're marching uh, forward uh, thus far, and uh, and we'll provide updates, um, you know, in subsequent um, NISPAC meetings. And then finally, uh, oh, oh, you know, a word on upcoming NISPAC meetings and understanding where we stand uh, with respect to uh, the, the, the continuing challenges of of uh, life in a. I don't know if we're supposed to say post-COVID environment. I don't think that really exists, but sort of in a in in you know as we we understand what new normal looks like here. I would say, and many of us had the opportunity to be together in in uh, in, in person, uh, you know, thanks to uh, you know what was an outstanding uh, co conference that AIA and NDIA put uh, put on uh, last week. Um, and I, I would say, uh, Mark, uh, if there's a way for us to uh, to return to in-person meetings, I think I heard earlier in the remarks that there'd be about another year before we could think oh. about that. I, I hope that that's something that we're able to revisit. Um, I understanding the challenges of that beautiful building that you all work in um, uh, that that may be represented there. I would you know point put out there, and I'm happy to take offline. There are other venues and options, um, but the importance of the dialogue, the opportunity for questions from uh, you know from folks who are in person or who are able to participate, it's the dialogue that really is is absolutely essential. Uh, it's been a long time. Heather Sims mentioned earlier that it's been so long since we've had an in-person meeting that the, the opportunity for dialogue, the, it, we're, we're all in transmit. Um, honestly, I don't mind transmitting. Those of you who know me know that's for sure. But it's really be, it's mostly, uh, it's, 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 it's transmit with the intent to receive. Um, that's, where, that's where we really uh, are able to address uh, and, and meaningfully engage on, on, on what are very, very important issues that certainly affect the department, uh, obviously industry, and, uh, and then more broadly the, the, full, the fullness of the executive branch. So uh, whatever we're able to do to help, um, turns out there's, there's lots of DOD uh, facilities around here. I'm pretty sure I could find one that, uh, that would be willing to play host, uh, you know, that's within uh, reasonable driving distance of here. Uh, so that we uh, at least explore the opportunity of in-person meetings. Uh, and with that, I thank you very much for the time, and I'm done. Okay, anybody have any questions for, uh, for Jeff? All right, Jeff, uh, thank you so much for the time, personal remarks. I appreciate it. It's been, been a real honor to uh, work with you and uh, people on this uh, this uh, committee. Uh, as far as the notice goes, uh, I, I uh, vow to you that we will share any draft with uh, 
you and also industry, it seems to me the most important thing is to get this one right. It's such an important topic. Um, and the cost, I can't emphasize how important it is that we get that, that right, too. I mean, this is a, a especially data-driven administration. Out of all the ones I've had the honor to serve in, this one, first question is, how much does it cost? And if I've learned anything in this chair and in this part of my portfolio as director of ISU, it's that the national industrial base is a target-rich environment, and we really need to tighten up the security. The problem is security is expensive. And in order to be able to help industry and also help ourselves, we need to be able to give uh, the Hill, the appropriators up there, and also the policy people to NSC the data that why we need to do this. That's the first question I, I get time after time as well, how much is this going to cost? And so anyway, it, it is imperative that we keep on that uh, working group and, and try to get those figures as accurately as we can because uh, they will be carefully uh, vetted and examined. Um, so, anyway, with that, uh, let's turn now to uh, Mr. Keith Minard, Senior Policy Advisor with the Industrial Security Director of the Defense Counterintelligence and Security Agency. Keith, floor is yours. Thank you again, Keith Minard, DCSA. And first, uh, Mark Lemmy on behalf of DCSA, thank you for your service and leadership to the NISPAC. Uh, it's a very important role, and the NISPAC serves a very important function. So today I'm going to hit a few areas. Uh, one, most importantly, FCL timelines uh, seems to be a, a theme today with uh, industry and with DOD, so we'll follow on that on a more tactical level. I want to hit some of the good news stories this year, uh, implementation of 32 CFR 7 and some other uh, key actions that occurred over the last year uh, with DCSA, DOD, and uh, cleared industry. It's very important to capture those events and those things that have been accomplished. So first, I know this is a key area of concern on um, facility clearance timelines. DCSA is currently working to reduce timelines for both the FCLs and upgrades to FCLs. We understand the concerns of both industry and government customers on the current timelines and are working to reduce those timelines. Uh, as part of our strategy to reduce timelines, we've established a tiering system for FCLs akin to those established for personal security investigations. This is to more accurately reflect the type of FCL case and better allow DCSA to manage those cases in a more efficient manner while managing risk. Each of these tiers have a key performance indicator for processing timeline goals, uh, each of the tiers. So to kind of give us an overview of what these tiers are is, the tier one are those cases with no identified risk indicators. A risk indicator is defined as a fact or event or circumstance or condition that may indicate a facility is ineligible for an FCL. So we're looking for those things that may warrant FCL not be granted in the first place. Our current KPI for those will be 60 days, though our current average for issuance is 155. You'll see as we're working through these processes how we need to reduce our timelines down to our KPIs. The tier two are those cases with identified risk indicators, but without a requirement to review or implement mitigation. Our current KPI for tier two is 90 days, our goal, but our current average is currently 266 days. The tier three are those cases with identified risk indicators requiring review or implementation of mitigation. Our KPI will be 180 days and our current average is 263 days. So additionally, to try to reduce these timelines, we've implemented a 90-day plan that began on, began on October 1st. The plan includes contractor surge support in understaffed areas, increased training, internal procedures, and increased efforts to reduce production timelines. The, the key point here with industry is we want to establish an external communication working group uh, to make sure we update our customers uh, to these changes and, and understand the criteria we're working with. So if you have any questions on looking for additional information on FCLs or processing questions on specific FCL processes, I'll share with ISU to share out with uh, the attendees our email box and phone numbers that they can call about FCL timelines and other questions. So the big thing I'd like to, you know, uh, that that's, FCL timelines is really a huge uh, um, effort that we need to work on right now, but I do want to address um, kind of the good news story for this past year. Really, this last year was a lot of partnership and engagement not only with the UCSA and DOD, but definitely with our industry partners and uh, other federal executive branch agencies on the implementation of 32 CFR Part 117. Um, huge effort, and it was really a success story and good news this last year. We know that there's additional requirements that we need to work with industry to address, areas of question or concern about consistency and how things are interpreted, but I think we've come a long way this last year on implementing a major change to the NISPOM uh, on the implementation of the rule. 
So, you know, I'd like to hand that out as really a success story for industry, DCSA, and DOD, and our other federal executive branch partners. So last August, we had the 32 CFR implemented. Uh, industry implemented the 32 CFR last August. Shortly afterwards in September, there was a new security review model, new rating system. Um, later in the later earlier in the later in the spring and the fall, sorry, was industry passed yet another huge milestone by reaching full enrollment of its cleared workforce in C V alongside with all DOD cleared personnel. In October, DCSA introduced a new field structure to better accommodate its evolving security mission landscape. Um, also, uh, that same period, the digital, I'm sorry, the digital repository for DD Form 254, as uh, Jeff Spinach talked about, NCCS, was sunsetted so we can implement the new system. In April of this past, of this year, we transitioned from DIS to NBIS. And I think one of the most important things we got to at the end of the year on the rule was, in August of this year, we deployed the unofficial foreign travel bulk upload capability as a DIS update. And that really closed out the implementation of the 32 CFR 117 from an operational perspective. So I think over the last year, we, we've had a lot go on. There's been a lot of successes and a lot of efforts by all parties involved. And I'd just like to go ahead and um, thank everybody involved for all these efforts. Um, it's a lot of success in enabling the protection of classified national security information in the NISP. And I, I think it's a, it's a way forward to show our best practices on what we do. Um, the next is actually an update on field reorganization. And this is just a quick update. As many of you already know, Mr. Larry Vinson is the Director of Field Operations and came on board earlier this year. Uh, since then, DCSA has hired three of the four new regional directors that are at the DISO level. And I think I want to foot stomp this. So what does this mean to industry under DCSA oversight? There are no additional changes to which field office you are assigned or you're assigned industrial security representative from the reorganization. Those changes already occurred, and we'll also make sure we keep uh, NISPAC informed of any future changes. Um, the last thing I have is during the most recent clearance working group, industry addressed a few areas that require follow-up, which included questions on DD Form 254s, security in depth, security rating model, and open storage. We have staff coordinated responses in writing, and we'll be sending those to the NISPAC for sharing with industry later this week. Um, that kind of closes my talking points for today, but later in the NISPAC, you'll hear from Mr. Dave Scott on DCSA authorization metrics and Mike Ray on clearance metrics. Subject to your questions. Anybody have any questions for uh, Keith? Okay, thanks, Keith. Next, we'll hear from Ms. Valerie Kerbin, Chief of Policy and Collaboration Special Security Director at National Counterintelligence and Security Center, Office of the Director of National Intelligence. Valerie, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and also um, many um, best wishes to you in your retirement when that date comes, and um, speaking also on behalf of NCSC, we really thank our partnership, thank you for our partnership and collaboration with ISU, and also working together with us um, with that connection with industry. So thank you so much for your service and your assistance um, over here at ODNI. You're welcome. Um, so let's see, so we have had a very busy spring over here at ODNI. Um, and I think you all have heard or at least been notified of the various levels of policy that have come out. Um, as you know, we work very closely with OPM, so us as the security executive agent and OPM as the suitability and credentialing executive agent. We have signed a few additional policies this spring and summer, so I'm just going to touch a little bit on each of them. Um, if you haven't received these um, or seen them, please get in touch with either myself or Heather after the meeting, and we'd be happy to share with you. Um, so we did jointly sign the Federal Personnel Vetting Investigative Standards. That was in May, May 18th. It was jointly signed. And this is where we've established a three-tiered investigative model. So I think we have also discussed with everybody that the current tier system of the five investigative levels, tiers, will convert to three, and it applies to those five scenarios for personnel vetting. We have the initial vetting, continuous vetting, upgrades, transfer of trust, and reestablishment of trust. And those are our, our um, distinct areas for reciprocity. And 
this type of information that is collected in those three investigative tiers will help the agencies make their trust determinations, whether it be a national security determination, a suitability determination, or a credentialing determination. So even though these have been issued, um, they are not effective at this time. We are currently working on the implementation guidance for the investigative tiers. Um, what's really important is that these standards meet the critical milestone on our path towards full realization of Trusted Workforce 2.0. Um, that model of different policies where we have um, started with that core doctrine and we have the guidelines and the standards, the next phase is getting to the implementation guidance. And this model will strengthen and empower um, agencies to ensure they have a trusted workforce, a mobile workforce, and that everybody is vetted in a timely process, a timely manner, um, which also will address risk and we'll be able to determine things um, in a more timely way and be able to act on things earlier on than waiting those five or 10 years during the reinvestigation cycle. So after the investigative standards were signed, we also worked to sign, um, our executive agents signed the common principles in applying federal personnel vetting adjudicative standards. So these common principles promote consistency and fairness in the adjudicative process, and it's to really go across all personnel vetting domains, where you have your suitability, fitness, national security, and credentialing. Um, in the suitability and credentialing side, there's still always going to be that 5 CFR 731, which is actually um, out in proposed rulemaking, but that's still always going to be the policy for making those adjudicative decisions. We on the national security side still use and apply seed four. It is still the valid policy for making the adjudicative determination. Um, but in the future, we will be looking at it and seeing if there's any updates that might be warranted. But for right now, there are still those two different um, standard structure, but these common principles really show what is the consistency and fairness in the process. Um, and again, the emphasis for these principles really want to ensure we have accurate reporting and recording of the personal vetting actions and that the determinations promote transparency, enhance that mobility, and facilitate information sharing. So that was issued in July, and then just this past September, we issued the Federal Personnel Vetting Performance Management Standards. So these management standards um, really establish the minimum performance measures and describes those key characteristics of quality management programs that will be used to evaluate personnel vetting. So when we as the executive agent or as ODNI comes out as the security executive agent, we want to ensure agencies are in compliance um, and we want to ensure that everybody would be performing, say, at the same level. And that way, with these new performance management metrics, um, we'll be seeing how agencies are doing and, of course, help them um, if they need additional assistance. But by assessing the success of personnel vetting programs, we're going to measure the efficiency, the effectiveness, fairness, and risk in the federal personnel vetting enterprise. And these performance management standards will also enable policymakers and the department agency heads and program managers to really look at the data and see if we need to make improvements in any way. So that goes in line with our whole policy framework. It's an agile policy framework and we'll be able to make changes and adjustments along the way to see how effective we are and efficient in the vetting process. So, those were three big um, policy documents that were just signed and issued. We are still working on other documents, um, such as the national training standards. And the training standards are going to be, um, as you know, they've been established already since 2014, I think it is. But we are 
making, um, we did a gap analysis and to see where we need to make some updates. We'll be putting out investigative standards, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, policy and the training standards for investigators, what they need to know and what they need to do, and for those adjudicators, what they need to know and what they need to do to meet those training standards. And remember, we want to make sure all investigators and adjudicators are doing the same job. They're doing things the same way and everybody um, understands what's required. Um, so, trust and workforce. I think you all have heard that um, you know, we were going towards 1.25 last year, last September, and now we've passed the milestone of September 30 for having agencies get ready for their 1.5. So most of the key agencies, everybody I think who's on this call, have certified to us that they have a 1.5 compliance program um, for continuous vetting. Um, where they'll be doing that continuous vetting process in lieu of doing the traditional periodic reinvestigation. So lots of great success on your part, agencies, um, and coming to us, and we're really proud of all the success we've been working on together to get to this interim state of 1.5. So from ODNI's perspective, um, we're still working on a lot more things. Um, there's a lot of moving parts. Uh, we're trying to keep you involved, engaged, and informed of everything that's coming um, down the pike. And um, as Heather said too, the harder part now is the implementation and being ready for it and understanding the impact to industry as well as the government agencies. But we're all here together working on this. We have great partnership with industry and um, our other CSAs and um, you know, seeing how to make this work and um, moving towards this whole new bold transformation and, and reform of trusted workforce. Um, two other things, we are still also working on the updates to standard form. Um, the thought is to have a new type of platform, kind of a combined format of all the investigative forms and um, depending on the position and position designation and what's required, um, applicants will be filling out certain portions of the investigative form. So um, updates are being, um, well, right now we're in the final stages of getting it ready. It's going to need to be posted into the Federal Register for public comment. So we will let you know when it does get posted for comment. And we've also um, made some updates to the implementation strategy. Um, it was issued last April. And we said that updates will be done iteratively as implementation progressed. So we've made some great progress, um, and that has also been revised and updated to performance.gov um, for you all to see what has been done and also what more we have to do to get to full implementation. So we do appreciate all the feedback from our government partners and industry and um, we look forward to you know, greater precision and ensuring that all the policies and guidance out there is going to be effective for you all. So um, I think that's, oh wait, I do have one more update, I'm sorry. Um, for the SF-312, it's the non-disclosure agreement. I'm sure you recall NARA made the change to the 32 CFR. Um, saying that the regulation has changed, allowing for the digital signature on the SF-312. So DNI is very close um, to submitting the changes, um, submitting a new form. Um, we are working with GSA. We're going to have to work with them to make sure the correct form is updated um, and be available for everybody's use. But right now, you could still use the current form, but just giving you that update we are hoping we will be done with those final stages of getting approval and submitting to GSA very soon. So um, I think that's it for me, Mark. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. Okay, thank you, Valerie. You know, that was a very fulsome uh, report, and I also appreciate your work on the uh, the 312. Yeah. Um, that's a really important change. All right, does, does anyone have any questions for uh, for Valerie? 
Okay. Thanks again, Valerie. Thank Up you. next, uh, sure, uh, Mr. Rich uh, Jossarend, Deputy Director of the National Security Services Division, Office of the Chief Security Officer at the Department of Homeland Security. Rich, floor is yours. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, sure. I also would like to thank you for your service and wish you the very best in your retirement. Thank you. Uh, I have two updates, uh, one regarding the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification Program 2.0. Uh, DHS is still monitoring DOD's implementation for any outcomes, lessons learned. Um, we're also looking at evaluating the cyber hygiene practices for vendors by the use of self-assessments uh, to evaluate the cybersecurity posture of agency contractors rather than conduct third-party assessments. Uh, that came directly from our National Cybersecurity Division Director, Mr. Dennis Martin. Uh, so in a nutshell, we are still evaluating uh, CMC, CMMC 2.0. Um, regarding Trusted Workforce 2.0, uh, DHS continues to implement Trusted Workforce 2.0. To date, DHS has enrolled about 85% of the national security eligible population into the ODNI Continuous Evaluation System. Uh, additionally, the department continues to work with our components to implement a plan to have 100% of the population, both uh, national security and public trust, uh, to include low-risk positions enrolled in RAFT Act by the end of FY23 fourth quarter and complete enrollment of the RAFT uh, Act eligible population no later than December 31 of uh, this year, 2022. Uh, by completing these milestones, it's going to allow the department uh, to begin placing periodic reinvestigations and receive immediate notifications of arrests or other issues um, in real time to provide early detections of risk and mitigating threats. And that's all I have, unless there's any questions for us. Anyone have any questions for Rich? I will thank you, Rich, I, I appreciate it. Uh, the next update, oh, you're most welcome. Yeah, the next update we will hear from is from Ms. Ms. Natasha Sumter. Program Planning and Management Team Lead, Office of Security with the Department of Energy. Natasha, the floor is yours. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, and um, I appreciate the introduction. Good morning to the NISPEC members and the meeting participants. We appreciate the opportunity to provide programmatic updates to our community. To you, Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for your leadership and your efforts to bring government and industry partners together to address and resolve challenges and often achieve um, programmatic updates and enhancements. We wish you much success. Thank you. So regarding the updates from the Department of Energy, first, thank uh -huh. you to Valerie Kerbin and the team out at ODNI for providing the update concerning the SF-312. The Department of Energy has actually issued a policy clarification to our community to allow our folks to actually um, conduct the digital signatures on the SF-312. So many of our organizations and sub-organizations are actually um, doing that now. So we appreciate that update. Concerning some of the questions that were brought to our organization regarding the cybersecurity maturity model certification, Department of Energy is currently not participating in that and we currently do not intend to do so. For the Trusted Workforce um, 2.0, we are making great strides in that direction. We are implementing that program and um, we are beginning to see some cost savings as the periodic reinvestigation requirements are beginning to go away for that and let's see, my my computer has frozen. I, I'm the one in my organization that always has computer issues. So y'all please bear with me if it takes me a moment. So also concerning the outlook on the return of investments from Trust Up Workforce 1.25, 1.5 and 2.0, those cost savings that I mentioned, they are, um, they are allowing us to focus those funds into other areas because we are incurring new costs associated with continuous vetting of our low risk and non-sensitive public trust positions. Unfortunately, we don't have that, um, that data right now to share with you concerning the actual cost savings. However, 
um, we anticipate being able to share that information in the future. Regarding the timelines concerning processing facility security clearances, PCLs, et cetera, you will hear more about the metrics concerning personal security clearance processing later on in this discussion. Today, when we provide our clearance working group updates, but concerning the processing time for facility security clearances, there are quite a few variables and other scenarios that impact the processing time in a perfect world, it would only take about six months to actually process a facility security clearance. However, because of those variables and other intricate details concerning key management personnel or key managing officers, security clearances themselves, exclusions, you know, it could really take some time to work through those processes. So we can't really give an average time on processing FCLs. We do not currently have any Department of Energy acquisition regulation changes on the horizon. So right now it's status quo. However, we do have some changes to DOE order 470.4B that were mentioned a couple of NISPAC meetings ago. Those efforts for updating, actually rewriting the order are currently underway. There are two integrated project teams that are splitting the order into two new directives. We anticipate this project taking approximately two years to complete. But once this project has been completed, we will provide that update and any significant changes along the way that will impact our community. <clears throat> Excuse me. Finally, uh, concerning any continuous improvements or um, lessons learned to share with the community. We don't have any additional information at this time. So barring any questions for me, this concludes the Department of Energy CSA updates. And I turn the floor back over to the chairman. Right, well, thank you so much, Natasha. Anyone have any questions for uh, Department of Energy before we move on? Okay. Next, we'll hear from uh, Mr. Dennis Brady, Chief Security Management and Operations Branch, giving the NRC's uh, update. Dennis? Um, Mark, um, NRC will not be calling in, so we can okay. move on to so the CIA, sir. My paint, paint by the number of talking points here. Let me scratch that out. I should have picked that up earlier. Ahead of, thank you. Okay, next and, and last, before we take a break, uh, we'll hear from Don. Chief Office of Security Policy giving the CIA's update. Don, floor is yours. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members. Um, from CIA's perspective, as far as timelines for investigation and adjudication, over the past 20 months or so, CIA's industrial program has reduced its overall case inventory of all types by 55%. In addition, we've reduced the cycle times for several of our key case types by 100 days. And then during uh, FY22, the industrial program set new monthly, quarterly, and annual records for production. And this was uh, conveyed to our industry partners at, the, uh, at a conference in McLean uh, back in September. Um, despite a significant increase in crossover requests over the past three fiscal years, CIA's industrial program continues to process clearance crossover requests in one to three days and nearly 88% are immediately approved. Uh, the other 12% of the cases require additional security processing and may not be completed in the typical time of 24 to 72 hours. And then on, the, on another front, uh, CIA's Office of Medical Services now conducts medical evaluations for incoming contractors who are being submitted for staff-like access, so uh, equivalent to full-time career staff officers. And so it's, it's very similar to what we do for our own officers as far as medical uh, evaluations. Uh, as far as process improvement efforts, our one primary continuous improvement effort and one that is an ongoing project is the development of a new case management system that will replace our legacy system. And this should result in some improvement of timelines. Time uh, the system is expected to be deployed with the industrial program in sometime in FY23. 
Um, and then finally on Trusted Workforce 2.0, the agency continues to look for ways to evolve our business in the context of Trusted Workforce 2.0 initiative and within the Federal Investigative Standards and Adjudicative Guidelines as they're published. And this is particularly true in areas related to continuous vetting practices, adjudicative thresholds, and general timeliness. And that's uh, everything I have for now for CIA. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Don. Anybody have any questions for uh, Don? All right, hearing none, what we're going to do right now is take a five-minute break. I've got uh, 11.25 on my watch here, so within uh, five minutes or so, around uh, 11.30, we will uh, start back up and, and wrap up our meeting for the day. So I'm going to temporarily adjourn for uh, five minutes. All right. All right, we are now moving into the portion of the meeting where we get reports from the NISPAC working groups. However, we will not be discussing all of the working groups at this time. We provided slides with highlights of all of them. We will only be hearing about the clearance working group and NISP information systems authorization, also known as NISA, working groups at this time. All right, I'm going to turn it over back to, uh, to Heather. Uh, Heather. Heather, yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You've already heard from 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 some CSAs and CSOs on the high-level points of what was discussed during the clearance working group on August 31st, 2022. We will also hear from GCSA for their security clearance and information systems metrics, along with metrics from DOE. The NRC workload and timelines performance metrics have also been emailed um, to all participants. We are now going to hear from Mr. Dave Scott, the NISP authorizing official for GCSA's information system update. Dave? Yes, thank you, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I've got two slides to brief you today. Uh, one is on national metrics and then other on a triage process that I've talked to you guys earlier about. Um, looking at a year in review from FY22, um, I'm really, really happy to report uh, one of the major items that we looked forward to doing this, the course of the past year was a reduction in our systems, really cleaning up our database in partnership with, the, with industry and also internally. This time last year, we had a total of 6,420 systems. I'm happy to report as of October 1st, that number was 5,634. That was due in large part to a lot of cleanup of, of systems that had previously expired, not closing out the risk management framework process, and then following through on decommissioning or when systems are no longer uh, active for use or required for use per contract. That in turn reduced our overall footprint of users in the, the database of record of EMAS from over 4,000 a year ago down to about 3,500, so we're happy to report that. This year, our authorizations for FY22 were just under 3,000 or around 2,918, which is a reduction of 3,400 the previous year. The previous year increase was due in large part due to COVID and a lot of um, kind of the, the, the cycle of uh, six-month authorizations. We, this past year, we made a, a big effort to get out on site and to reduce our footprint of uh, conditional authorizations and move towards full three-year authorizations. And on the left-hand side of the chart that we had, uh, you can see the ATO and ATOC breakout. I'll bring out to light. Um, this time last year, our three-year authorizations were sitting around, or full authorizations around 54%. You can see the significant increase up to about 61%. And that's, again, due in large part to us getting out there back to industry, um, assessing the risk, uh, and, and making those full determinations. And then also a reduction in pending uh, risk or conditional authorizations down from about 20% last year to, to 16%. So we're happy to report that as well. Um, and then in large part to the, to the partnership with the NISA Working Group, we made a significant change into our system in January of last this past year, where industry wanted transparency into our, our database of record of EMAS, where they could see the full, the full life cycle of their packages from start to finish. And then also we wanted the capability to provide um, a better in national metrics and then also for workload management internally. Due to large part, the, the transition happened in January. I'm not unable to provide FY22 metrics, but we can provide a, um, a snapshot of about 700 workflows as of October 1st, where our DCSA time, uh, this is calendar days, it's 61 days for us to make an authorization decision. And our goal within the published DAPM is 90 days, so we're well within those goals. 
and we're going to continue to uh, come up with uh, process improvements to um, throughout the year through our EMAS application in order to continue to uh, strive towards consistency and also uh, enhance timelines. A little breakout of the, the uh, authorization workflows, again, these are active workflows, uh, not FY numbers, is um, for our three-year authorization uh, decisions, so those are around 51 days. That's where we do a, a complete package review, on-site review, and make an assessment uh, recommendation for an authorization is, is about 51 days. You'll see the, the days are, um, for an extension on the, on the slide is around 70 days. That is due in large part, be, um, that could be, that's a tool in the, the authorization officials toolbox where uh, we may need to get some additional resources, we may need to get on a plane, or maybe we're, we're waiting for a last minute item that we need to close out prior to making that authorization decision, and we can extend a current authorization. Um, and those are usually decisions are made a little bit closer towards expiration, which is why that's a 70 day um, and, and a little bit higher than the other number. Moving on to the next chart, um, we have uh, I've provided uh, national triage metrics. We at um, our headquarters level have uh, contractor staff uh, called uh, SCA or Secure Compliance uh, Assessors, uh, they're contractors and they review the incoming packages from industry um, and this is a process that we stood up a few years ago to really improve consistency and timeliness. And it's really starting to show uh, the goodness of, of, of this work of the triage process. This past year, from a national metrics perspective, these, these are FY22 numbers. We had 8,642 packages um, that have gone through our triage process. Now this number is significantly higher due in large part because of the January 2022 uh, workloads, um, that modification that we made. And that's why we had thousands of packages we sent through the workload all at once. And that's um, why there was no triage conducted on those. And that's what that's a, the 2,593 number. Um, but we'll start to see throughout the FY, um, we'll have a, a better metrics to report as far as uh, the actual triage coming in and going forward, and then also uh, return for rework. The top three items, uh, return for rework from industry, again, this is kind of the step one. Um, this isn't a, a true assessment. This is making sure that packages are complete and following our published job aids. Our uh, implementation plan, our improper, uh, our, our improper uh, complete in, uh, implementation plan, uh, test results, uh, not completing the test results or, in, or uh, or satisfactory in order with the job aid, and then missing artifacts, which is simple as providing contractual work, uh, such as a DD-254, uh, and then also missing hardware baseline, software baseline, so simple items. Um, and then uh, also just kind of to wrap it up from the triage process, uh, from a comparison from FY22 to FY21, we're really starting to see the return on the benefit of having the triage in place. Um, when we first started, it's not on here, but uh, on, on the, the page, but when we first started, we had significantly higher return, uh, packages returned, well over 50%, and I think it was closer to 60, 70%. And you'll see in FY21, our return for rework was 36%, and then we've improved uh, drastically reducing that number down to 28% in FY22. And that's in large part to a partnership with industry and industry uh, submitting good, clean, consistent packages um, throughout the year. Um, and then also, in addition, due to the, pack, the fact that the packages that are coming in from industry are, are, are really much better and more complete and accurate, our uh, timelines have re been reduced for a triage from FY21, which was nine days, down to now four days. So uh, that, that I'm happy to report that we'll continue throughout this next FY. We've got additional plans and upgrades within EMAS to really improve upon our metrics uh, and consistency throughout the, the, this FY. And that is all I have to report pending any questions. Uh... Okay, thank you. I really appreciate that. All right, we're now going to hear from Mr. Mike Ray, Deputy Assistant Director of Operations of Vetting Risk Operations with DCSA for their vetting statistics. Mike? All right, good morning, everybody. Um, we'll start off with the investigation inventory and timeliness. Um, for the investigations program as a whole, the inventory continues to remain within a stable state. Uh, you can see the inventory of industry cases is at 26,000. Um, going down the slide there, the timeliness for industry for T5 initials for FY22 Q4 is 121 days. That is an improvement, a 72-day decrease from 193 days end-to-end in Q1. 
for the T3 initials for FY22 Q4 end to end is 95 days, and that is a 23-day decrease from 118 days end to end in Q1. Um, on the next slide, we'll talk about the uh, CAS updates. Um, you can see on slide one from the upper portion of the slide, the DCSA current adjudication case inventory stands at approximately 26,000 cases. This includes all types of customer service requests, incident reports, tiered background investigations, and continuous vetting alerts. The DCSA, uh, DCSA has uh, maintained stable inventory levels for the past two fiscal years. We expect in fiscal year 2023 that inventory may increase with the increasing derogatory nature of work associated with the remaining inventories of periodic reinvestigations, continuous vetting alerts, and incident reports. Um, you can see in the lower portion of the slide in FY22, DCSA adjudicated just over 184,000 cases. Um, the output, as you can see here, has been relatively stable for the past two fiscal years, which is a trend that we expect to continue into the foreseeable future. Moving on to the next slide, the adjudicative timeliness for initial tier background investigations, uh, T3s and, T and Tier 5, is at 21 days and 7 days respectively, as provided in the upper left-hand corner of the slide. Of note, due to deferment of eligible periodic reinvestigations and into continuous betting, periodic reinvestigations uh, inventories have drastically reduced. Coupled with the increasing derogatory nature of the remaining cases, we expect periodic reinvestigation inventories will continue to remain above our timeliness goals until the remaining inventories are depleted. At the bottom of the slide, you see ne nearly half of all denials and revocations executed in FY22 were initiated by a continuous betting alert or incident report. Please continue to send in those incident reports to self-reporting is important. Our top reasons for clearance denials and revocations continue to be financial considerations, criminal conduct, personal conduct, and drug involvement. Uh, for reciprocity, even though it's not displayed on the slide here, we are delivering sustained performance in our reciprocity portfolio, uh, delivering reciprocity decisions on average within one to three business days. That's from submission to decision, a vast improvement over our performance two years ago. And for the next slide for Vibro updates, uh, the total FY22 investigation request submissions were at 207,000. 90% of all investigations had to enter determination on average uh, within seven days. FY22 incident reports triage were at 20,000. FY22 customer service requests were at 54,000. The industry population is enrolled into Trusted Workforce 1.5, and Vero posted additional guidance on how to enroll individuals through submission of an SF86 at five-year intervals and also how to verify enrollment. The SF86 submission provides updated information that supports the success of the CV program. Post-enrollment alerts are generated based upon established thresholds, which align with federal investigative standards and adjudicative guidelines. CV is, is impactful as we average about a 6% alert rate. Criminal and financial are the most valid actionable alerts. And in FY22, we received 45,000 entry alerts, of which 18,000 or 40% were not previously known and that's from 31,000 unique industry subjects. Please note that this information should have been self-reported as our goal moving forward is to have individual self-report information as it occurs. And pending any questions, uh, those are the updates from the CWG. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. Anybody have, have any questions for, uh, for him? All right, if not, we'll turn to, uh, again, to Ms. Uh, Natasha Sumter, DOE, for her metrics. Natasha, floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On behalf of Mr. Tracy Kendall, who is the Department of Energy Personnel Security Policy Program Manager, I have these updates for you. So going on to the next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So as you can see on the, the chart, the overall um, or overall DOE has met the average timeline metrics over the past four quarters. So this is definitely a good news story in comparison to some of our other slides that we have um, provided over the, the last year. So next slide. For our tier five initials, we've met the ERPTA goal of 11 out of 12 months, and we expect this trend to continue 
in the positive direction. Next slide. So for our tier three initials, we have met the ERPTA goals 12 out of 12 months, which is another good, good news story for the department. And again, we expect this trend to continue moving forward. Next slide, please. For our tier five reinvestigations, we've met the ERPTA goals 11 out of the 12 months. And this is an improvement from our last briefing uh, to the NISPAC where we met the ERPTA goals for over the last nine to 12 months. So yet the department is continuing to improve our process times. Next slide, please. For our tier three reinvestigations, we had a hiccup in June of last year, but we have since resolved that and it has been smooth sailing in the upward motion. So um, pending any questions, this concludes the Department of Energy's clearance updates. Thank you, uh, Natasha, appreciate that You're a welcome. lot. Any questions uh, with the DOE on, on uh, the metrics? All right. Uh, I see next, Heather would, would be NRC, but we're going to be getting those uh, later. So now let me turn to Mr. Perry Russell Hunter from the Defense Office of Hearings and Appeals, also known as DOHA. Perry, floor is yours. Thank you, Mark. And, and I would like to start out by uh, recognizing the exceptional federal service of the chairman um, and uh, Mr. Chairman and, and members, if I, if I may, uh, I just wanted to say how much I appreciated um, uh, your leadership, Mark. And uh, for those of you who do not know this, uh, Mark is also a, a prolific author, and I am uh, eagerly looking forward to reading um, whatever books he writes in retirement. I appreciate uh, that, Perry. You're, you're too kind, but still. So with, with, with that said, um, I... I really appreciated uh, getting to follow uh, Mike Gray because the, the reports from Vero um, are, are very encouraging. Uh, there is no question that with uh, continuous vetting now being uh, the, the order of the day since thanks to trusted workforce uh, reforms uh, and replacing the uh, periodic reinvestigation, we are now finding adverse information sooner. Um, what that means is that potentially, as, as Mike pointed out, um, as we run toward, as the, the, the COD cast runs toward the end of the, their inventory of uh, PRs to look at, they are going to be getting more of the cases that have the derogs because those were the issue cases that took more time to resolve in the first place. Uh, but also, as uh, Mike pointed out, um, the financial and criminal uh, cases are not only the most frequent CV hits, but they are also the ones that had the highest validation rate. Um, what that means for the due process end of things is that we, we will see an increased number of cases with potentially disqualifying information. I say potentially because um, uh, this is where the new investigative standards come in. Um, and if I may quote from the new investigative standards, risk is effectively managed by promoting information collection of both positive and negative information to include national, uh, to assist national security suitability, fitness and credentialing adjudications in making a whole person trust determination. And also uh, from a separate section that um, ISPs must conduct any required additional investigative actions to collect and review all the relevant and available facts and documentation sufficient to resolve the issues uh, that are found. And so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really footstop this because issue resolution um, is, is the way of the future because the CE or CV hit gives us only a fraction of the information. We're getting it much sooner than we would have otherwise with a PR but there is still that rest of the story to be told. Um, so uh, with that, I want to turn to um, uh, two of the great successes of recent time 
of Doha working together with the D, uh, DCSA CAS. Uh, number one, uh, we are uh, timely with all of the uh, legal reviews of industrial um, statements of reasons, and that means that notice is getting out timely to uh, industrial uh, cleared and would-be cleared employees um, about uh, what issues have been found, um, so that's good news. Uh, the other good news is that the CAS is working on an initiative uh, whereby uh, they're going to start um, issuing conditional clearances in industry, uh, and that is with the full support of Doha, because one of the clearance reform principles that we've all worked toward is the idea of being able to resolve cases at the earliest possible point uh, in the process with the fullest information. That not only helps us reduce timelines, it, it is also the most efficient and effective way to proceed. And so, um, while uh, we have the advantage of learning more information sooner, uh, that really makes it incumbent on all of us throughout the process um, to, to do robust issue resolution. And uh, I'm happy to report that the uh, Doha and the CAF um, stand ready to continue to in innovate in that area. Speaking of innovation, and this is my last point, uh, we are uh, holding more due process hearings uh, than ever before, and that means that we are doing, uh, we're traveling more than we have in the past two years uh, for in-person hearings. We're also holding a lot of in-person hearings, uh, both at our uh, Woodland Hills Telework site and in our, our main headquarters in Arlington. Uh, but in addition to that, we are also um, holding more cases than ever over remote video teleconference. Uh, we're using a secure DOD version of Teams, um, which is, uh, is obviously uh, secure where other remote video uh, platforms like Zoom are not. Um, so we're protecting PII, but at the same time, we're, we're able to get to you virtually, if not literally, sooner. Um, so uh, that, that concludes my report. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Perry. Uh, anyone have any questions for uh, Perry about Doha? All right. Up next is Ms. Heather Harris, Acting Associate Director for the Control of Unclassified Information Program at ISOO. Heather, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Implementation efforts of the CUI program continue. It is still a requirement to safeguard and handle CUI in accordance with Executive Order 13556 and 32 CFR Part 2002, the Implementation Directive for CUI. One of the highest priorities of ISOO as a CUI Executive Agent is getting a CUI Federal Acquisition, Federal Acquisition Regulation Case, also known as a FAR Clause, issued. This will create a common mechanism to communicate which information contractors create for and receive from the federal government that must be protected, how to protect it, and who it can be shared with. Currently, laws, federal regulations, and government-wide policies already mandate these protections. Once the FAR clause is issued, it will be a standard vehicle for conveying whether CUI is involved in the contract and what the existing requirements are for safeguarding it. The CUI program uses the most common existing information security controls, the Federal Information Processing Standards, also known as FIPS, Publication 199, Moderate Confidentiality Impact Level, as the standard for systems containing CUI. We worked with the National Institute of Standards and Technology, also known as the NIST, to incorporate these requirements into a contractor-specific environment and framework using NIST Special Publication 800-171, which reduces the control contractors need to implement. If there are any questions about CUI, please direct them to CUI at NARA.gov. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Heather. Appreciate that. Okay. Um, we're now at the point of the meeting where we ask for NISPAC members to present any new business they may have. Anyone wish to uh, have the floor? All right. No new business. All right. Do any uh, other committee members have any questions or remarks before we uh, close out this meeting? All right. I have just a, a couple. I wanted to uh, thank you all for being such uh, great colleagues and wonderful uh, 
public servants. I, uh, you know, I'm going to retire right now, uh, June 1st of uh, 2023. Looking forward to it. It'll give me about 38 years of working in the government and out. I started out as a young CIA officer in Pakistan not too long after the Soviets invaded Afghanistan, then went up to uh, uh, the Hill for a bit, worked for uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, had a sojourn as a public defender in D.C., and then went to DOJ right before 9-11, 16 years there, and then came to ISU thanks to President Obama's appointment uh, in uh, December 2016. So I've had a good, fulsome career. I've done a lot of things and, and uh, you know, pleased to have, have served my country and uh, have met such wonderful uh, colleagues. But one of the reasons I, I'm retiring now is is that this job requires uh, two things. It requires being nominated by the Archives of the United States, and it requires um, presidential approval. And whether we're going to have a continuation of this administration or another one, I wanted to give uh, the powers that be ample time to pick another uh, director of ISU because I think the position is too important to uh, languish. So I wanted to give everybody plenty of time to, to uh, get their ducks in a row and get this uh, seat filled. So anyway, if you're ever down in the Shenandoah Valley, uh, please uh, don't hesitate to uh, look me up. I hope to be in Lexington, Virginia, where I went to uh, college, a uh, nice college town. So I'm looking forward to writing a third book and watching you all uh, keep the country safe. So uh, with that, our next, or your next NISPAC meeting, I'll, I won't say our anymore, your next NISPAC meeting is scheduled for Monday, June 5th, 2023. Meeting will be a hybrid of in person and virtual the day before the National Classification Management Society or NCMS annual training seminar in New Orleans. Uh, as a reminder, all NISPAC meeting announcements are posted in the Federal Register approximately 30 days before the meeting, along with being posted to the, uh, the ISU blog. Uh, I, I certainly uh, sympathize or heard uh, you know, Jeff Spinnaker's remarks about having in person meetings. I think they're absolutely critical. Um, well, one of the oddities about the National Archives is we are uh, open to the public. Our, our building is, is you know, annually visited by hundreds of thousands of visitors from all over the world. And in fact, we had an active uh, COVID case that was reported today. So, you know, we're, we're uh, a bit unusual in that. But that said, I mean, I, I think that uh, God willing and, and uh, you know, if, if these vaccines work, we should be able to begin to, to meet in person, I, I would hope, uh, you know, very, very soon. I'm uh, trying to hold a, a, a state, local, tribal policy advisory committee meeting in, uh, in January in person. So that would be a nice uh, nice kickoff. So anyway, with that, uh, I'm going to uh, adjourn the meeting. And uh, again, thank you all for your, uh, your wonderful public service. Goodbye.